Hello again, welcome back, and uh, today we're going to be starting our next lesson talking about Chapter 5, Section 2, The Turmoil Over Taxation. Uh, this, uh, this lesson coincides with pages 146 to 153 in your textbook, and if you're using the online textbook, please go to Chapter 5, Section 2, but most of you should have your, your textbook at that point, so that's one less thing that you have to worry about being on your computer. Now, our central question for today is, why did Parliament try to tighten its control on the colonies? And then, on the other side, what was the outcome of that? So, why, we're going to look at why we think that, uh, why Parliament, why England tried to tighten its control, and then what happened from that. So, our key terms for today are Pontiac's War, the Proclamation of 1763, the Stamp Act, Petition, Boycott, Repeal, Townsend Acts, Writ of Assistance, and finally we will end today talking about the Boston Massacre. So to start us all off today, I want you to start by looking at this. This is a very famous uh, picture of the Boston Massacre. And it was, it's an engraving that was done by none other than Paul Revere, you know, the guy that was made, was famous from that, uh, the, the poem, the British are coming, the British are coming. Um, well, this is a, an engraving, a picture that he did of an event that happened in Boston. Um, and if you look very closely at the Br British soldiers, you can see that the British soldiers are shown having, a, having smiles on their faces as they fire on the seemingly unsuspecting colonists. Um, so if you were living in the colonies at this time and saw this picture, uh, how, do you th how do you think that you would feel about the British soldiers? I mean, this was a, an image that was circulated through a lot of the uh, colonial gazettes and the colonial newspapers. So if you were um, someone living in, say, Pennsylvania and you heard about this uh, heard about this event in Boston, and this is the picture that you saw. How do you think that you would feel about that? Would you say, oh, the, it's okay, the soldiers were just quieting a riot, or uh, or would you think that it would stir feelings of resentment and uh, almost like hatred for the British? So I want you to uh, keep this in mind, like if, because a lot of what we, what we talk about, it's really... Um, there's a lot of room for interpretation because if you look at it one way, it could be one thing. But if you look at it another way, it's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe this was wasn't the greatest uh, thing to happen. So um, this event, I mean, this did happen. This is not this is, wasn't something that a person just made up. Like this was an event that did happen. But depending on who you ask, um, either the British soldiers massacred the colonists, hence the Boston Massacre, or if you ask somebody else, they will say, well, they were just defending themselves and accidentally fired into the crowd. Um, and one thing that we will study throughout this, throughout this year, will be bias and interpreta interpretation, uh, knowing what bias is and knowing how to recognize it. Now, for instance, this is a good, uh, a good example of bias because Paul Revere was one of um, it was a member of a, a group of colonists known as the Sons of Liberty who existed to, quote, desire to break away from British rule. So if that's what, if he was a part of this group and that's what his group was going for, um, how do you think that affected the way that he uh, depicted this scene? Do you think he would depict it in a way that favored the British or possibly more favored the, uh, favored the colonists? So... I want you to keep that in mind as we move through today. So I'm going to start out talking about Pontiac and a proclamation. Now, as we learned in Chapter 5, Section 1, uh, the French and Indian War ended as a great victory for Great Britain. Um, France had been driven out of the Ohio Valley and basically had to give up all lands east of the Mississippi River. And it greatly diminished uh, the influence that France had in North America. Um, now, So now that the Ohio Valley was completely open to 
to the British, uh, many British colonists started moving into that area. Um, thanks in part to stories from trappers about how great the land was on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Now, up until up to this time, the Appalachian Mountains kind of acted as a natural barrier uh, for the kind of like keeping the British colonists between um, between the Atlantic Ocean and the Appalachian Mountains because they were very tough to cross. But there were these stories from fur trappers saying, "Oh, the land! Once you get past it, the land is amazing." Um, and now that the French were out of this area, uh, a lot of colonists were like, hey, let's, let's move in. But um, one thing they forgot, and one thing that we, we forget, is that there were still many Native American nations living in this area. Um, and some of these, some of the Native Americans had sided with the French. Uh, so a bunch of British colonists moving into their area was one of the last things that a lot of these, uh, a lot of the natives wanted. One in particular was uh, this man, Chief Pontiac. Now, the French in that area had traded with the Native Americans, with the Indians, and treated them with respect. Uh, we mentioned that in one of the previous sections about the differences between the way that the the French settlers treated the Native Americans versus the English settlers. Um, so the, the French had treated them with respect, but British leaders chose to instead to raise prices on goods um, as they traded with the Indians and allowed settlers to build forts on and farms on lands that were uh, not so much owned, but like that were... Uh, Indian Indian lands, like things that they had had been their land for generations, so it's kind of understandable that this angered many of the Native Americans, especially one Ottawa chief uh, known as Chief Pontiac. Um, he was a very well respected and fierce warrior who had fought on the side of the French, and um was spoke very outspoken about against the British settlers intruding on their land. So in the spring of 1763, Pontiac started to lead, lead attacks against British outpo outposts and forts, and within a few months he had captured most of the British forts in the Ohio Valley. Uh, as you can see from this map, you can see uh, the different forts, the Fort Joseph, Fort Miami, uh, Fort uh, Sandusky, uh, Venango, Labouf. So, like these are forts, like through what's now Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Illinois, Indiana. Um, so he captured a lot of the forts uh, in this area, um, but this time known as Pontiac's War did not last very long, um, because in October 1763. Um, his French allies informed him that they had signed the Treaty of Paris, which, as we know, brought an end to the French and Indian War completely. So, since the French had signed the peace treaty with Great Britain, it's like, all right, well, any hope of French aid uh, was over. So, slowly, the Indian nations that had joined the fight dropped out and returned home because they're like, look, we can't keep this up forever, and without any hope of French aid, it's like, well, I guess we'll just have to give up and go home. So that was Pontiac's War. It was it was very short lived, but it was uh, it showed that there was this conflict between the British settlers and the Native American tribes and nations that were living in these areas as the British moved west, as the colonists moved west, um, tensions grew and grew and continued. So this is something that will, it didn't just end here with Pontiac's War. We're going to be talking about this a lot throughout this year. So I just want you to uh, to note Pontiac's War and what happened there. Um, so what about the, res what do you think happened in response? So in response to Pontiac's War, uh, the British government issued what they refer to as the Proclamation of 1763. Now, this proclamation stated that col 
colonists were not allowed to move west of the Appalachian Mountains. Now, this was meant to, this was twofold. It was meant to protect uh, the Native Americans that were living in these western lands. But um, many of the colonists uh, just ignored this law and moved west anyways, despite the fact that there were about 10,000 British troops sent to enforce this law. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, this is, and again, this is a recurring theme. You see uh, the British make just a blanket statement, a general, a law saying, all right, you can't do this. Colonists look at it and say, mm, no, I think I'm going to do this anyways. Um, and this angered a lot of people because they had, uh, a lot of the colonists had laid claim to lands on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and partly now, as part of the proclamation, the colonists now, there were extra taxes to pay for these troops that the British government sent to enforce the law. So, they, A, they were angry because they had made claim, land claims and now they weren't able to go and collect on those land claims. And B, um, money was coming out of their pockets to pay for British troops that they didn't want in the first place. So a lot of people saw this as like just the British government trying to uh, control their daily lives again. So in one way that any government can control is through taxes. So let's look at some of the new taxes that were um, that were instilled after the French and Indian War. Um, if I impart any wisdom to you throughout this year, uh, let it be these next three words. Wars cost money. Seems pretty simple, but when a war is over, I mean, during during the war, I mean, there's a lot of like the, between the fighting and equipment. Um, and all that, its resources get used up. But when a war is over and the winners and losers have been decided, uh, the next thing that needs to be decided is the subject of payment. Soldiers cost money, food costs money, weapons cost money, ammunition costs money, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, and the fighting in North America especially took a huge financial toll on Great Britain. And the citizens of Great Britain needed to find a way to pay off the debts that they had incurred during this seven years war. Um, and since the colonists were the ones that directly benefited from the victory, then it seemed logical that they would be the ones that should pay for it. So a series of taxes were imposed on the colonists that they had no, they had no say in and were very, very much opposed to. Um, the first of these was a tax on sugar that had actually lowered a previous tax, but what this tax did was it made it easier for British officials to catch and punish smugglers. So the tax was cheaper, but it hit, it, it kind of went at these, the, this, uh, huge smuggling ring that was going on. So following the Sugar Act was the Stamp Act, and pictured right here is actually a um, uh, a picture of an actual stamp from the Stamp Act, which required all documents, playing cards, um, basically anything that was made out of paper uh, had to have this specially sanctioned stamp on it. So anything that was made out of paper had to be made out of um, this special paper or have a stamp on it saying that it was approved by the British government. Uh, and at this time, these kinds of taxes were very common in other countries, but up until this point, Great Britain hadn't imposed this kind of a tax uh, on, the, on the colonies. So it was like the colonists were like, oh, whoa, what's, what's going on here? Uh, where's this coming from? So one newspaper actually went so far as to make uh, make its own stamps, and they put them on the around the spot where the British stamp should go. So um, I think yeah, I think the uh, the British government gets the idea from that. So 
all across the colonies, uh, these riots broke, broke out to protest the new laws and the new taxes, with some of them actually turning pretty violent. Uh, tax officials were tarred and feathered and then run out of town on a rail. And that it sounds funny, like you, you've probably seen like Bugs Bunny cartoons or something where they talk about tar and feathering somebody, but this is actually really, really painful. They would dump boiling hot tar on the person and then cover them with feathers. So it have, they would have to try and when they pulled the feathers off, it would actually pull chunks of skin. So it's not a, not a pleasant experience. So they, some of the tax collectors would be tarred and feathered. Um, some of them had their houses ransacked or burned. Um, and this violent reaction shocked, uh, shocked a lot of the British who really couldn't understand why these new taxes would get them so angry. And pictured here, you can see the picture this of a one of the officials being tarred and feathered and run out of town on the rail. Um, and I mean it's so it's a it's a cartoon, so it, it looks kind of funny, but in reality it was a very, very painful thing to do to a person. Um, now this is the part where um I feel like the the colonists uh their claim that this was a, I feel this is a valid claim though, because, um, they claimed they, the, uh, that they were protesting because, that, because the taxes were not fair because they had no say in forming the tax. So there was taxation, but they were not able to represent themselves in the forming of the tax. So the, the, ruling body, Parliament, um, had no representatives from the colonies. So the colonists argued that they would only pay taxes that they had agreed upon, or that they at least had a say, had a vote in. Um, so this cry of no taxation without representation went up and became this rallying cry uh, against British rule in the colonies. And it was this, it was this, and it was all over, it all started over the Stamp Act. So if you remember back to the last section, we talked about uh, the Albany Plan of Union and how Ben Franklin wrote up this charter to unite the colonies. Um, and all of the delegates and representatives were on board, but then when it went out to the colonies, it, it was not approved by a single one. Well, this one uh, Stamp Act united the colonists in a way that previously was had been impossible and was thought to be impossible. So, and even during the French and Indian War, getting the colonies to cooperate was difficult, but, as we mentioned, but by 1765, with this Stamp Act, uh, nine of the colonies elected delegates to drop petitions to send to King George III and to Parliament, declaring that they had no right to tax the colonies without their consent. And Parliament paid little attention to these petitions. So in response to that, so first there's the petition saying, you have no right to do this. Parliament ignored it. So they're like, all right. So the colonists decided to boycott British goods. So if you want someone's attention, you you got to hit them where it hurts. And in this case, uh, hitting them where it hurts was in the wallet. Uh, and this boycott was actually very successful. And by 1766, uh, the Stamp Act was repealed, or which means removed. Um, but a law was also passed stating that Parliament could now raise its taxes really just whenever it wanted. So they got rid of the Stamp Act, but there's a new act on the saying that Parliament can now just raise taxes whenever you want. Which brings us to this man, Charles Townsend, and the acts that bear his name and the results of those acts. So 1766, the Stamp Act is done away with, and in its place, a new act which gives Parliament the right to just make taxes whenever. So June of 1767, um, after a lot of argument in Parliament, the Townsend Acts were passed on which as taxes on glass, lead, paper, paint, and tea. Uh, 
Now, these new taxes were pretty low, but the colonists responded with the same complaint that the complaint that they were being taxed without their consent. So it's like, all right, yeah, these taxes aren't very low, but the principle here is that your parliament was passing these taxes uh, without any kind of colonial representation. So the colonists had no say in the formation of these taxes. So, and that they just, they didn't have a chance to uh, represent themselves in parliament. Now, along with establishing these taxes on lead, paper, paint, and gla glass, and tea, uh, the Townsend Acts set up new ways of collecting taxes. And this is the, this is the big point. So it's, yes, it, it set up actual taxes, but it, it set up a new way of collecting them. Um, now, and this new way was that officials, in an attempt to try and stop the smuggling that had been going on, um, British officials could now board ship American ships in American ports using um, a writ of assistance, and a writ of assistance would allow them to ex inspect a ship's cargo without giving any kind of a reason. Um, so, to put this in terms that maybe uh, that are a little bit more current, this would be like a police officer coming to your house and just walking in and looking around your room and lo looking through all of your stuff without even telling you why he's there. Um, so, I, if someone did that to me, I would feel as that's that's a violation of my personal property and my my rights. Um, so. I can obviously, I can definitely uh, see why this made the uh, the colonists uh, angry. It made them even even angrier because the writs of assistance violated their rights as British citizens. And under British law, no official could enter a person's home without a without a good reason that they are suspected of a crime. Um, now today, officers need to produce a search warrant for the same reason. So. I mean, these these colonists, they were still British citizens, and under British law, this writ of assistance uh, was illegal. But because they were in the colonies, it's like, okay, well, now we're gonna we're gonna do this because there's so much smuggling going on. Um, so up and down the coast, uh, the colony the colonists responded with more boycotts of the goods that would be taxed under the Townsend Acts. And one group in particular I talked about a little bit earlier was formed to protest these new British pol policies. And this group is known as the Sons of Liberty. Remember that name. Now, they were known to hold fake hangings. Yeah, fake hangings, where they would bundle up straw and dress it in a British uniform and then hang that from a tree to show what would happen to any official that tried to collect on these unpopular taxes. They called it hanging in effigy. It's, that was what an, an effigy was. A was basically like they made a, a fake person out of straw. Um, and they also visited different merchants in and around the towns, especially in Boston, and urged them not to buy British goods, not to buy goods that would be taxed under the Stamp Act or the, the or then the Townsend Acts. And by urged, I mean at times they, for lack of a better word, threatened. So, um, so as the unrest in the colonies grew, new leaders started to emerge that took a very firm stance against the British rule, um, primarily in New England and also in Virginia. And among the most vocal of these leaders was um, the two men uh, pictured above, Samuel Adams and his cousin John Adams, who John Adams would later become uh, John Adams, the second president of the United States. But we'll get to that in a couple chapters. So at this point, John Adams is a lawyer uh, in Massachusetts around uh, the Boston area. Now, his cousin Samuel had been a failure in a lot of different businesses, but he was he had a lot of talents when it came to uh, organizing people, uh, arranging protests, and really 
drumming up um, public support. So he wasn't as very successful in business, but he was successful in getting people to come together and to protest and to um, come together under like I ideals. Now, John Adams, I have a lot of respect for. Um, first, he had been a school teacher um, before becoming a lawyer. Um, and he was a little more on the cautious side than his cousin was. Sam Samuel Adams was a lot more like outspoken and gung ho, whereas John Adams was more a little bit more intellectual. Like it was like, look, we need to think these things through, and we need we st we are under the British crown, so we need to um, act accordingly and go through the proper channels. Um, so he was more a little bit more on the cautious side, but he was still very well respected. He was a very intelligent, very learned man. Um, and he was especially respected for his knowledge of British law. Now, from Virginia, I mentioned that Virginia was another hotbed. Um, George Washington became a voice of protest against these new taxes, um, as well as uh, um, a very well-known, well-respected lawyer named Patrick Henry. Um, and Henry was actually so outspoken against the British policies that he was accused of being a traitor. So he was very, like, very bold and uh, outspoken. Um, so, and we'll we're gonna talk a little bit more about how outspoken Patrick Henry really was. Which brings us back to this picture from from the very beginning of the lesson. Uh, it's now time to talk about what really happened on this night in uh, March 5th, 1770. Um, so we already know that the colonists were unhappy about the new taxes. And recently there was an act that had been passed called the Quartering Act, uh, which forced colonists to provide food, shelter, and supplies for British soldiers. So we've got the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Act, and now the Quartering Act, which... So with each new act from Parliament, the frustration level in the colonies rose all, that, all the more. So in response to this like social unrest, Britain sent two regiments of soldiers to protect the officials there. Remember, we mentioned the violent outbursts. Um, but by sending the regiments of soldiers, it made the colonists feel like Great Britain was trying to strong-arm them, trying to bully them uh, into behaving and into, into acting like they they acting like they should. Um, and I don't know about you, but when someone tries to force me to do something, instead of just saying, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I should do, um, I'm likely to more, more likely to be like, what? No. Um, so apparently the colonists had that same rebellious streak and some, some more than others. Um, so during the night of March 5th, 1770, a mob of very angry colonists gathered outside of Boston's Custom House uh, and began shouting and throwing rocks at the British soldiers. And at one point, one of the soldiers panicked and fired into the angry crowd. Um, now, the other soldiers, it was like one, one gun went off, so the other soldiers started firing too. And when it was all over, five Americans were dead and eight more were mortally wounded. Now, history tells us that this gentleman, Crispus Attucks, uh, an African-American sailor who had spent 20 years on ships to avoid being taken into slavery, was the very first person to die, making him the first American casualty of what would become known as the War for Independence. Now, the colonists were completely outraged by this, um, and many of those who had been in opposition to British rule just saw this as the opportunity to make those that died, like, turn them into martyrs. A, mar a martyr is um, a person who dies for a cause um, and is looked at as um, 
looked at fondly like and ha kind of held in very high regard so um among those was a silversmith named Paul Revere who we already looked at his engraving of of the Boston massacre um began to be this engraving was circulated throughout the colonies um a to tell people about what's going on but b it also was to kind of drum up these anti-british feelings so now what about the soldiers that were involved well the soldiers were arrested and tried for murder in a boston court and if they would be found guilty then they would they would be put to death um but as part of british law and now as part of american law they were given a right to a trial by jury and the person that was chosen to defend them as their lawyer was john adams the same john adams that was part of the sons of liberty and the same john adams that was uh samuel adams's cousin and uh despite his views on patriotism uh he was very devoted to uh to justice and to upholding the law and it was this devotion to doing his duty and doing his responsibility that proved to be stronger and he was actually able to convince the jury that the crowd had incited the riot and that the soldiers were simply defending themselves um and in the end two of the soldiers were punished but none of them were put to death and that brings us to the end of this part of the recording and I'll be right back to talk about the um to talk about what we're going to be doing for today's assignment all right so for today's assignment I want you to try and put yourself into John Adams's shoes um I want you to take yourself out of this and think like hmm all right think as John Adams would your cousin Samuel is very outspoken against the British um and you yourself you're very outspoken against um injustice but and you are a patriot he's one of the sons of liberty but you have also been called on to defend soldiers that had been accused of shooting the protesters in Bo the Boston massacre now as Samuel Adams you today was the first day of the trial um and you you gave your arguments as to why your clients the british soldiers are not guilty that they were simply defending themselves i want you to as samuel or as john adams I want you to write a journal entry about 5 to 7 sentences from john adams perspective um what are your feelings about the trial um how does your position as a lawyer to for the quote the enemy affect you personally um and how are, especially how are you balancing your feelings of patriotism with your own personal responsibility as a lawyer to defend your clients now this assignment will be worth 15 points and historical accuracy will be taken into account um with the grading so please make sure that if you say a name that it's a name of, of actual an actual person um but more importantly uh this is a chance for you to be creative so I really want you to uh to take this and uh, have fun this is this is one of my favorite uh like I I really enjoy this uh this assignment I've got some really really cool uh um journal entries in the past that like very very in-depth stuff so I'm really looking forward to reading all, reading all these and like so so think about it like if I was John Adams and I had to balance my personal responsibility with my personal convictions um how would I do, how would I do that so 